Hello and welcome to uh, this month's Wing It webinar on managing the blend. So uh, thanks for joining us today. This one's a bit of a, a topic that I get asked about all the time, not necessarily around leadership um, and performance, but more so around how it is that I run my family of six. So as many of you would know, I have got four uh, little boys aged seven and under here in the Nitschke household and to say that we are managing the juggle or rather the blend is uh, certainly very true and rings true in our household. So I thought today would be a really good opportunity to sort of go through some of the hacks and tricks that I use uh, to make our lives easier and to be more productive and make sure that, you know, overwhelm isn't something that I'm suffering from all the time. So before we get too far into it, I um, wanted to let you know that uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am the founder of Made For More. Uh, I am a leadership and performance coach. Uh, what, something that you may not know about me is about 15 years ago, I hung up my ballet shoes and retired as a professional dancer. I went out into the big wide world and started looking for a real job, uh, which came in the shape of working in the banking and finance sector. So I worked there for a number of years. Early on in my career, I absolutely loved it, loved the challenge, loved the corporate setting, and so was promoted fairly early on um, and sent on my way to go and recruit my very own team, open up an office, which was super exciting. And during that time, I actually did, I recruited a beautiful team. They were fantastic. Uh, and I was, I was able to hand select them. So it meant that they were highly performing. Uh, also, one of them happened to be my husband. We've been together for 13 years. So I do like to joke that uh, I, I recruited him and that's how we ended up uh, being together is, you know, he was, he was one of my staff. So that was quite funny. Uh, and then about 10 years ago, it uh, was around when the GFC hit here in Adelaide. Working in the banking and finance sector obviously wasn't a great time um, when GFC was here. And because my team was so well performing and so high performing, we were all promoted and disbanded. And I was sent uh, to another office and I was sort of fronted with a wall of about 14 women. And that is very much when my leadership journey began. Uh, you know, these women, they were super unhappy, weren't very happy to see each other or themselves, or, you know, certainly not there to, very happy to see me with my uh, optimism and ready to conquer the world. So it was certainly a challenge uh, early on in the piece, you know, within a couple of months, I knew that I needed a coach to give me a little bit more of a strategy around how to actually lead a team of disgruntled employees versus lead a team of highly, uh, highly driven and highly performing staff that I got to hand select. So that's sort of how I ended up becoming a leadership coach. That's how come I became a courageous conversation specialist. I spent probably 12 months really uh, deep in deep in it with the performance conversations that I had to have. Uh, and then about five years ago, I went and had uh, four babies in five years, which is as crazy, but as awesome as it sounds. And uh, that's completely flipped my perspective on leadership. And I think it's really important that we start talking about leadership from a mindset perspective, uh, being the leaders of our own lives. Certainly today we're going to be talking about being the leaders or the CEO of your own family and your own household, which is uh, one of my business besties. Uh, that's what what she uh, how she explains who I am is I am the CEO of my household, um, which has really changed, I guess, the mindset of how I run things here. So before we go um, too far into it, I'd love you to have a little bit of a think about what it is that is, you know, work-life balance. There's a lot in the media around, you know, juggling um, work and juggling and juggling life and getting balance and self-care. And in fact, there is no such thing, I hate to break it to you, there is no such thing as work-life balance. But what we need to start thinking about is the language that we're using. So before we get too far into it, the people that I talk to all day, every day, uh, you know, they're mostly women. I spend a lot of time uh, at school drop-off and at childcare, so I'm speaking to a lot of parents. And, you know, in this world, we're in 2020, this world that we're in, we're suffering from major, major levels of overwhelm. And I mean, uh, overwhelm in the most purest form is we've got 
to-do list longer than our arms. We're running from sport to pick up to uh, making sure that we're showing up for our family, making sure we're showing up for our friends, you know, still trying to have a conversation with our husband now and then. Uh, and, you know, there's things like the notices that come from school. There's the childcare um, notices. There's, you know, making sure you've got food on the table for your family. I'm not sure what happens in your house, but we are, you know, continually at the shops getting milk and wheat bix and goodness knows what else, or bread, of course, you know, with four boys, they eat a lot. It's very true what they say. It's definitely not um, a myth. Boys eat a lot of food. I don't know what girls do. They probably eat a lot of food too, but I've only got boys in my house. So that's all I know about. Uh, making sure that, you know, everyone's where they need to be at the right time, keeping on top of bills. Um, vaccinations, of course, is something that happens a lot in our house. Um, with the frequency, we're not going to get into a vaccination debate here today, but, you know, just keeping on top of it all and, you know, don't get me started on the actual washing. I hate hate, hate uh, washing. We've got a sock monster in our house and I am continually uh, buying socks only for there never to be pairs. So it is a saga in our house and it's something that we're continually keeping on top of. It drives me crazy. Um, and then of course, you know, you become an event planner as well. I've got two kids that are at school and their social calendar between birthday parties and uh, play dates is full on, although it's been a lot easier recently where we've all been in lockdown, but of course everyone is eager to catch up and get out of the house. So being able to work out the logistics for that in our house is uh, crazy times. Um, and I mentioned, you know, we've, we've got family that we need to be showing up for and supporting, whether it's um, parents or grandparents or siblings, whomever it happens to be, you know, showing up for them, um, being the best, you know, being a contributing part of the family. And then of course we've got uh, our friends as well. And I'm very lucky to have a great group of uh, friends and, and it's really wonderful the amount of time that we, um, you know, that the amount of time that we get to spend together because, um, you know, you need, you need people outside of your immediate family and you need a, a tribe of people that can support you through all sorts of, um, parts of your life. So it's very true what they say, uh, your tribe, your vibe attracts your tribe. And that is 100% true in my case. So when we start thinking about overwhelm, you know, we know and we've heard that, you know, put your oxygen mask on first and that's what you need to be doing. And, and yes, absolutely we do. And I'm, I'm a self-professed martyr in my house until I actually started practicing self-care as an experiment. Not so much because I thought it would help me, but I was like, right, let's, uh, let's dig deep on this self-care and see where it gets us. So often we kind of go one extreme to the other, you know, we're completely overwhelmed. We're like, Oh, I need a day spa or I need a day, um, you know, relaxing and being pampered and massage, which of course is amazing, but not often a viable option for many of us, you know, both financially and time wise. And I think that taking the time out to really celebrate some, uh, some of your wins is so, so important. So day spas, absolutely. But here at Made For More, um, filling our cup is on one of our Crush It Daily activities. And we talk about doing something for yourself every single day. So it can be a warm cup of tea. It can be uh, something like a bath, if you've got a bath. It can be going for a walk um, by yourself. You know, that's certainly one of my... Uh, one of my outlets is to actually get out of the house, go out by myself. I listen to a podcast, listen to some music that's probably not appropriate for children. And that is my release and my time. So just being able to find what it is that works for you to fill your cup. And it doesn't need to be an extravaganza. It doesn't need to uh, move the world. And it could be, you know, 20 minutes of uh, meditation. It could just be quiet time. Whatever it is that you can do in tiny little snippets or parcels of your day, uh, get going with that and try and do it every single day. And if you don't have 20 minutes every day, start with five and build from there. But as John Maxwell says, consistency compounds and it is absolutely true. The more consistent that we are uh, with the things that we want to do and the things that we want to make up our life, you know, each of the puzzle pieces that make up our life, we need to consistently do them uh, every, every day to make sure that it becomes a habit and then we can, and then we can have room for other things as well. 
So like many of you, uh, I know that we, we can get caught up in a bit of the Beyonce, you know, I would love to nail life like Beyonce's nailing life, keeping in mind she's got millions of dollars at her expense and I'm sure a team of staff. In saying that, she has a very, the exact same number of hours that we do as well. So in a week, there are 168 hours, which is a bit mind boggling. But if we think that we're sleeping for eight hours a night and uh, that's what we should be aiming for, and I know that many of us, don't do that uh, for whatever reason. But I've also done an experiment on sleep as well. As someone who has been chronically sleep uh, sleep deprived for many, many years, uh, I know that sleep is a huge contributing factor to being able to show up for my family, being able to show up for myself, and also just the way that I feel like it really resentful when I don't have enough sleep and it's somebody else's uh, fault, not blaming anybody, uh, definitely the three-year-old. But Beyonce has got the exact same number of hours in her day, uh, sorry, in her week as what we do, 168. If we're getting eight hours of sleep a night and we know that that's around the, around the mark, that is 56 hours a week. If you work full time, that's eight hours as well, which is another 56 hours a week or a third of our week. So if we spend a third of our week sleeping, a third of our week working, it leaves an entire third of our week to do all of the other stuff. Uh, that we do and you know when we start thinking about if we've got the same amount of time as a work week as we do at home you know why is it that we're still so overwhelmed and either this will be a bit cringeworthy for you or it won't but we actually spend on average three to four hours every single day on social media watching tv so we've taken a huge chunk of our life and we've given it away to uh, numbing out so you know scrolling mindlessly we're not with no purpose watching binge watching tv and don't worry i've been there for sure um, but it's a habit that we get into where we start doing it every single night and when we start thinking about the hours of the day that we're using or losing uh to socials and tv is it, it makes it pretty depressing so I don't do Netflix anymore. I use nighttime to either work or sleep. I go to bed pretty early and or read and, you know, meet with clients and things like that. So being productive and actually making a choice as to how and when we use the time that we have available to us. So often, well, almost every time, overwhelm comes from having too much information. You know, we can see everything happening. We can't see the trees for the forest and we get overwhelmed because we often don't know where it is that we want to point the arrow. So to really combat overwhelm, we actually need to begin with the end in mind. You know, what is it that we're trying to create for ourselves? You know, from a lifestyle perspective, what are we trying to create from our family? If we could design our ideal week, what would it look like? You know, are we doing uh, school drop-offs and on Monday mornings, lunches are already, we can calmly get, get ourselves organized. You know, do we work only three days a week? Do we work four days a week? Can we work after hours? You know, start designing your life. You know, how often do you work out? When are you catching up with your friends? When are you catching up with your family? If you could sit down and design your ideal life and not many people actually take the time to do this. Um, and it's certainly new to me. I've always been a goal setter uh, ever since I was very young, but I never really sat down to think about, you know, yes, I've got my big yearly goals, but if we chunk it down, what is it that I want my weeks to look like? Or what is it that I need to get done uh, this month to move, move the needle? What is it that's going to move the needle? What are we aiming for? What do we as a family have... Um, have to do or what is it that we're trying to achieve at the moment we're working on readers uh, if you're interested but you know beginning with the end in mind is so important to combat overwhelm and then we can just chunk it down so have a look at what it is that's uh, overwhelming you is it that you've got too many things on is it that you've got uh, too much social work is it do you not have enough hours in the day you know what is it that's that's bringing up all of these feelings and then we chunk it down into bite-sized pieces on how it is that we can overcome these things. So what we want to be doing is we want to be moving from overwhelm all the way to Beyonce's side and be crushing it like Bebe. And to do that, we need a few things. So we need to start adjusting our expectations. So you know, expectations play such a huge part in our role. These days in 2020, you know, we're expected to do this, we're expected to do that. But really having a look with the things that you are expected to do, are they your expectations? Or are they someone else's? Are they the social norms? Is it very much a keeping up with the Joneses? And more importantly, are the expectations that you're putting on yourself 
are they actually serving you? I would think not. Uh, the next one is flexibility. So I'm not just talking about working from home and uh, working flexibly. Of, of course, you know, pretty much everyone in the world is going through some kind of uh, work from home flexibility at the moment, but this is being really flexible around what it is that's important to you. Uh, you know, what is it that's going to give you creativity? What is it that you need? Uh, and again, I'm talking about really having a look at what's working and what's not. And I heard a great quote recently, which was, you can't see the label from inside the jar. So this is the work, you know, when people say you need to do the work on yourself and what is it that you're doing and fill your cup and self-care and hashtag blessed and vulnerability and all the rest of it that's going around at the moment. And this is very much around taking time out and we've had an opportunity most recently with coronavirus to actually take some time out and take our foot off the pedal and have a look at uh, what we're doing and almost everyone that I've spoken to has said it is so great to be able to stop and have a rest and it absolutely is so before we start putting more stuff in our jar uh, let's just start having a look at what it is that you actually want to put in your jar if it's not going to serve you if it doesn't um, work with your family norms then really start assessing whether or not that that is something that you want um, you know in the rest of the 2020 we're coming up to the financial year which is a great time to have a 2020 reset I know that I do a lot of um, work finance around financial year end and financial year beginning and there's no reason why we have to wait until the new year on the 31st of December to restart where we're at so work with what you've got um, work with where you're at with what you've got and at the moment uh, I think it's a great opportunity right now to do a 2020 reset on what it is that you actually want to put back in your life rather than uh, trying to jam everything back in uh, our third thing there is boundaries so you would be familiar with the term boundaries but what often happens when it comes to boundaries and I run a, a workshop called courageous conversations where we talk about boundaries so this is more often than not how come we end up in situations where we need to be having a courageous conversation it's because we're not clear on our boundaries we don't know what they are we don't know why we've got them uh, and we often don't actually even notice that someone's crossed our boundaries until it starts to build resentment or anger or a response to us and then we like go hmm okay that was actually a boundary I needed to I needed to communicate that with whomever it was that crossed the boundary that that's not okay so being really clear on what's in in the boundary what is okay what's out of the boundary what's not okay and then saying no um, I've never had a problem with confrontation in fact I quite like confrontation and I would far prefer to be uh, uncomfortable than walking on eggshells all the time so I have I'm very good at saying no uh, which means that my yeses are real yeses so if there's for an example a social event that's coming up and I don't want to go not interested don't have time I'll say no thanks rather than yes and cancel at last minute if there's something on that I do want to go to I am yes and I will move heaven and earth uh, just to get there because when I'm yes I'm all in and when I'm not I'm not and I'm really okay with uh, not being halfway and I think that's important as well is if you mean no uh, if you say no then we really need to mean no and as Brené Brown says if you're not familiar with Brené Brown you should definitely check it out I'll put her details in the chat Brené Brown whoops spell it properly Brené Brown uh, she is a shame researcher out of Texas Austin and she is just incredible so shame sounds like a funny thing to research and it definitely is but she became most famous for a TED talk that went viral on the power of vulnerability so she has been researching shame for I don't know 20 plus years around what is it that gives us shame what is, is it that gives us guilt uh, how do you have a whole how to live wholeheartedly what else does she talk about oh the power of vulnerability of course is her TED talk and she's written a stack of books as well uh, most recently her book on dare to lead which is around uh, leadership in the corporate world but also leading in your life and one thing that Brene Brown says is clear is kind unclear is unkind so when it comes to boundaries we actually need to spell it out people don't know uh, we can't assume that they will be able to read our minds we actually do need to spell it out and let them know what it is that our boundaries are and before you can do that you need to know what your boundaries are yourself 
Our fourth thing is energy. Of course, we all want more of it. Um, how do we start cultivating it? Uh, I've got four boys at home. I need a lot of energy and I was not getting a lot of energy. So everyone has their very own unique success formula on how to cultivate energy. I get a lot of energy. You know, I'm an, an extrovert. I love uh, meeting people and being around people. But I also get a lot of energy from uh, being able to use my creativity. So being able to cultivate that is really important to me. Uh, and the way that I foster that and I guess uh, nurture that is to make sure that I've got time out to actually uh, unashamedly and guilt free use my creativity. I get a lot of my creativity happens when I'm out on my walk. So it's sort of a double edged, a double edged sword there. I'm filling my cup and I'm also gaining some energy as well. And then making sure that I power down at night. So you know, most people are familiar with the idea of a morning routine and then I establish a power down routine, which is a nighttime routine and sticking to that as well. You know, screens off after nine o'clock, I'll read a book, have a cup of tea and lights out by 9.30, uh, 10 o'clock on the weekends, you know, if I'm really going wild and really sticking to that. And as John Maxwell says, consistency compounds and it is absolutely true for your morning routine and it is absolutely true for your power down routine at night. Um, and then our last thing is hacks. I mean, we're in 2020. If you're not hacking something, then what are you even doing with your life? So we'll have a look at some of these things uh, over the next 30 minutes. But I have got some really wonderful um, hacks that I use and uh, you can use as well. So we'll go through some of those. But before we get too far, I wanted to start talking around with our expectations, our flexibility and boundaries, we need to really get our mindset right. So what happens in society is if we imagine this here as an iceberg, up the top we've got our behaviours and down the bottom we've got our beliefs. So what we normally think is, uh, behaviors are going to drive results. You know, you go to the gym, um, eat well, you'll get results. Uh, if you stay organized, stay on top of everything, keep it all together, you'll get results. But what we know drives results is actually our mindset or our beliefs. So above is our conscious mind. These are the decisions that we make um, consciously. And then below the line is our subconscious or our unconscious. And these are the things that drive our behavior. So if we have a look above the iceberg are things like your goals and your vision and your values and your strategy. You know, what is it that you're doing to get through your life? This could be things like your planners or how it is that you run every day. And then underneath, this is the important bit. So down below is our belief. So you can see it's quite busy there. We've got things like unwritten rules that you might be telling yourself or might have been told that are outdated. Um, beliefs, you know, what is it that you actually believe about yourself and how many of those are limiting beliefs? And the thing we know about beliefs is that they're just that, they're not actually true. Uh, assumptions, we all know what it says to assume. Uh, feelings obviously play into it. Norms, are there any social norms or cultural norms that you're sticking to? that are outdated or no longer serve you. Our conditioning is such a huge part of uh, the way that we are. You know, why do we do what we do when we know what we know? And it's all to do with conditioning. And if we start unpacking conditioning, a lot of it has to do with our early childhood and how we experienced early childhood. So they say that your conditioning and beliefs, most of it is formed uh, by the time you get to seven. My eldest is now seven, so I'm trying to condition him to do some more vacuuming. It's not working just yet, but I'll keep going. But very much uh, the way that we see ourselves and the way that we behave is all um, the foundation work gets done before we're seven, but we can change it. Uh, the other part of beliefs or mindset is uh, the culture. You know, do we have some cultural beliefs um, that, have, that have come into play, our perceptions, our habits, you know, our daily habits form so much of how we get the results or more so don't get the results. If you habitually have chocolate every day, you're probably going to keep having chocolate until you make an active decision not to. Uh, the mindset that we start adopting, we've all heard of growth mindset and, uh, and set mindset. And then the last one is the stories that we tell ourselves. And this is such a huge uh, problem for people in society today. Last year, I got to see uh, Dr. Libby, who is a biochemist GP in Queensland. She came, she was doing a tour 
around Australia. She's also an author. And one of the things that she spoke about was uh, the women. So she works mainly with women is um, the stress that women are under these days. You know, uh, it's all to do with weight gain and it's leading to stress is leading to disease or dis-ease. And she was coming up with all of these, um, I guess, theories around what it could be that was causing these problems. So she started to do a bit more research because she was like, okay, you know, all of this disease and unhealthiness is caused by stress, but what's actually causing the stress? And the more and more uh, women that she spoke to and the more research that she did, she found that stress, actually the number one contributor to stress is the stories that we tell ourselves. And this is things like the internal monologue that happens. And sometimes we're aware of it and sometimes we're not. And if you're not aware of it, it probably means that you haven't separated your thoughts, your subconscious thoughts um, from your conscious thoughts. And I actually like to call this, the stories we tell ourselves is the itty bitty shitty committee. So they're the, uh, the little voice that comes to town and reminds you of all the reasons why you can't do something or shouldn't do something or should do something. Um, and shoulds, we can throw them out the door because they do not serve us. But what she found is we can, if we can actually start getting a handle on the stories that we tell ourselves, then we can start actually controlling the stories that we tell ourselves. And one of the best ways to do this is by writing it down. So first we need to actually capture it. So capture what it is and recognize that it is a story as in its imagination, it's make believe it's not fact or true and actually write it down on paper. So not typing it on your laptop, but actually get a, a physical pen or pencil and write it down on a piece of paper. And once it's out of our subconscious mind and onto paper, we're able to consciously analyze whether or not it is uh, probable. And more often than not, the things that we're telling ourselves or the itty bitty shitty committee has uh, really just bolstered in our own minds into something that's quite uh, quite unreal and, and quite unhelpful. So this is why journaling is so powerful, letting your mind just um, flow. And then when you start looking at it afterwards, you can say, oh, hang on, that's not true. Why would I be thinking that? And what we can start doing when we get a handle on our stories is actually cancel it and stop that itty bitty shitty committee, particularly when it's not serving us. And more often than not, it's not. And that in turn reduces our stress. So when we're having a look at the iceberg model, what happens is we've got the wind blowing up the top from the left, blowing a gale, it can be you know, uh, going quite quickly, and then we've got the current happening underneath. And what we think we need to be doing is you know, working on our goals and our vision and our values and our strategy and what are we doing and how do we show up in life and what's my Instagram reel look like and that's gonna get me the results. Whereas in actual fact, the current is much stronger than the wind. So the iceberg is going to be moving with the current and the current is under the waterline. It's the, the bottom of the iceberg. We know what happened in the Titanic. That's where all the, the problem stuff happens if you've seen the Titanic. And what we need to actually get a handle on is the beliefs and the mindset that's happening underneath uh, for us to be able to get some results. So one of the other things that I love to do uh, around productivity is the Pomodoro method. So uh, Pomodoro, I don't actually know where it came from, um, but I will find out and let you know. But one of the things that happens with overwhelm is one of the antidotes is massive action. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, the best thing you can possibly do is not lay flat and wallow. It's 10x your activity or, you know, go, go all in, go some massive action. Uh, that's why cleaning spurts are so huge but I actually do uh, the Pomodoro method for work you know um, we all have we've all been working really differently lately and it's been a lot more difficult to work with distractions at home uh, my distractions currently the fridge which I have been snacking on all day but what I find is uh, my productivity really plummets if I'm not laser focused about what it is that I have to do so I've discovered this method Pomodoro um, Jane Anderson who is a branding expert mentioned it at an event I was at and I thought I'll get onto that and see what it is so Pomodoro is basically working in sprints so if you have worked in a project previously in the corporate you'd be familiar with the term agile and also sprints but it's breaking your day into tiny chunks and then laser focus working on that only. So I Pomodoro my life a lot, uh, most of the time. So uh, the way that this works is you decide what chunk of work you're going to do. It could be housework, could be work work. It depends what it happens to be. I work in a 50 minute, 10 minute uh, cycles, so hourly cycles. 
and then I set the timer for 50 minutes. So I figure out what it is that I want to do, set the timer on my phone for 50 minutes. I turn off all distractions. So I turn off any notifications on my laptop, close all emails, close anything that might possibly distract me apart from the task that I'm doing. And I head down and head down, thumbs up, not head down, thumbs up, uh, head down and get my work done for 50 minutes. And I just go hell for leather uh, for 50 minutes. My timer goes off. I stop what I'm doing, go and get a drink, go to the bathroom, whatever it happens to be that I need. And then I reset the timer again. So working in these little short sprints and you can do uh, a 25 minute, 25 minute sprint with a five minute break as well if you've got smaller pieces of work or less time so that's a 30 minute sprint works really effectively because we don't have time to procrastinate we don't have time to get distracted we actually don't have time to touch you know 15 different projects or 15 different pieces of work that we're doing we just laser focus on what it is that we're meant to be doing Interestingly, uh, years ago when I used to work in the banking and finance sector is we used to have this dot method, which is basically anytime you picked up a file, like a loan file or a customer file, is you'd put a, a sticky dot on it to see how many times you touched it. And the ideal number of times was like uh, three, I think, from memory. So you'd have these sticky dots, sticky dot stickers on your desk. And every time you picked up a file to work on it, you'd touch, you'd put a dot on there. And it was really interesting, the busier uh, we were, so the more files that you actually had stacked up on your desk, the more dots each file had. So rather than focusing on one file and going woe to go, uh, or, you know, doing as much as we could before you had to pass it on to someone, is the more files that we had we actually ended up touching them more and more because you try and do a little bit over here and 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 before we knew it we'd done we'd been busy being busy but not busy being productive and they're two very different things so it's interesting with the Pomodoro method it follows the same philosophy on the dot method is laser focus on one thing go all in on that uh, shut out the rest of it and you'll find that your productivity will 10x and mine certainly does as well so we decide on the chunk of work that you're working on you set your timer for 50 minutes you work on what's actually going to move the needle until the timer goes off so we're not Facebooking for 50 minutes we're not checking emails for 50 minutes this is what's going to give you the momentum uh, the momentum gives you the motivation the motiva motivation keeps you going then we take a short 10 minute break the timer goes off go and make yourself a cup of tea i'd highly recommend get up and get moving if you've got a fit ball bounce on that because it will change your vibrations and your energy levels and then you start the whole thing again and if you've only got an hour then just take an hour and do that and if you've got more time do that but being really strategic with the way that we uh, do our work and then getting a laser laser focused on it is going to mean your productivity improves immensely so one of the other things we talked about was boundaries so i wanted to show you what happens with boundaries and why we need to work on them so this is the incubator of resentment. So what normally happens is there is an action or a behavior, and this happens in all scenarios. I teach this in the Courageous Conversations uh, workshop around having courageous conversations. But what would normally happen is there is an action or a behavior. So uh, if we're thinking work-life balance, you know, something happens and we get called into a meeting at last minute, or it could be Susan's le left her coffee cup in the sink at work and it's super annoying and then we don't say anything we don't want to you know rock the boat we don't want to feel uncomfortable uh, hang on sorry my computer's freaking so out so we just say nothing and we let it go and there's an action or a behavior that happens in a coffee cup we don't want to make the relationship uncomfortable so we do nothing then what happens is it happens again and we start thinking oh susan what are you doing with your coffee cup why aren't you uh you know washing your coffee cup and leaving it in the sink for everyone else oh my goodness susan um you're so lazy and we start telling ourselves a story about it so here's our itty bitty shitty committee um we, you know we start saying yes to things that we don't want to be saying yes to and inside we're like oh i don't really want to do that but i guess i have to i guess i should it's what's expected of me and this is all stuff that we're telling ourselves that's not true. The next thing that happens is, uh, you know, Susan's left her coffee cup in the sink. You walk past her desk and she's blow me down. She's got crumbs on her desk. That Susan is a pain. She's lazy. 
she's messy, she's a bit of a grub, and I just think she's no good at all. And before we know it, we've told ourselves this entire story about Susan and how terrible she is and our itty bitty shitty committee is going overdrive. We uh, catch up with our friends on Friday night and start telling them about this situation that's happened, and then they start recognizing these kind of behaviors too. Then what normally happens, and this is in the work setting, is we still don't say anything because we don't want to be uncomfortable and the resentment is building and building and building and this happens in our own lives as well if you've ever had um i don't have this in my house because we're very good at courageous conversations but if you've ever had something where you know your husband or um, partner just doesn't uh notice that the floors need to be mopped or doesn't notice the washing again this is the bane of my existence you know the washing and you don't want to say anything because you don't want to be a nag or perhaps you have said something but nothing's changed and you don't want to you don't want to rock the boat. You don't want to start a fight, but it keeps happening. And the more that it keeps happening, the more that it happens. And a classic example of this is actually around washing. I've obviously got some work I need to do around the washing is uh, my husband is great around the house. We um, share a lot of the chores because they're his kids too and his uh, family as well. But he did the washing and used to put my clothes in the dryer. And uh, one day he put like a new clo a new woolen jumper that I had and it obviously shrunk in the dryer and I was furious and in my mind I was like oh he did this on purpose and I can't believe he doesn't pay any attention to what needs to happen with the washing and how many different times do I have to tell him and he's not really trying he's just doing this on purpose to stuff it up so that then I have to do it and this was all you know internal monologue that was happening um, and this is over years of you know a few dry incidents and you know he got home and he was so proud of himself he'd done all the washing and he'd taken the kids out to do something and you know all of this stuff was great but my internal monologue or the itty bitty shitty committee had just conjured up this entire story that he was like out to get me and my woolens and I was so cross about it and uh you know he got home and really copped an absolute mouthful from me uh which was not very grateful or gratuitous at all so uh this incubator of resentment is a really tricky thing to recover from um and we want to be discomfort uh, so Brené Brown says discomfort over resentment so you know have those tough conversations get it out on the table rather than being resentful because resentful is a very difficult place to come from so one of the other things that I love about uh, Made For More is one of our top values is joy. So we are joy seekers here at Made For More and I think it's so important in terms of uh, building your own energy. Uh, we talked about that earlier and uh, the more that we start looking for joy, the more that we find it. So we've got this sneaky little thing in our mind called the reticular activation system and the way that it works is the more that we focus, uh, the things that we focus on are the things that we see. So if we're always seeing problems and always seeing negativity uh, and barriers, we're always going to find negativity and barriers. But if we start looking for the good things if we start looking for joy if we start practicing gratitude um then that's the more the more often that we're going to come across that and we're conditioning our brain to find those things so joy seeking joy is one of our highest values and seeking joy is certainly top of the list so figure out what it is that actually gives you joy uh one of my big joy bringing activities is uh dance floor so i actually love dancing i've got a, a history of being a ballet dancer don't do ballet on the dance floor because i'm too old for that now but being able to actually um let loose and have a boogie is something that brings me joy and leaves me feeling joyous for many many days so whatever it is that works for you do that I've spoken a little bit around um, success formulas. So we've all got, or you know, the seven steps to a your very own uh, personal success formula. So one of those is growing yourself first. So having a look at, you know, your boundaries, having a look at what it is that you actually want your life to look like. Uh, what is it that brings you joy? Are there any conversations that you're not having that you should be ha having that will make your life a lot easier? So growing yourself first. We've got to do the work on ourselves first. Learning about others. The more that we can learn about others and from others means that we've got a far wider, I guess, reach on the things that we can we can pick and choose from. So at Made For More, we do a lot of work with leaders on leadership and leadership mindset. And the work that we do is basically around educating them on picking and choosing the bits that work for them. So there is no one size fits all. There is no model that you can 
well, there is no model that you can model. Um, it's very much a choose your own adventure. So learning about others and learning from others will give you so much, so many more resources to draw from to make your life easier. Uh, dropping your defences. Uh, so this is so important and something that I practice all the time. Brené Brown is certainly an expert on this, but being able to show up in a vulnerable way and being able to have a tribe that uh, you can talk to is wonderful. Being able to be open and honest with the family in your life. If there's, you know, boundaries that they're, they're crossing, you know, being able to talk about those. If there's help, then ask for help. I uh, haven't found someone yet when I've been talking on this topic, you know, if someone asked us for help, we would give it in a heartbeat. If someone said, hey, can you just help me with X, Y, and Z? You would say, of course, if it was within your power. But yet we're always so reluctant to ask for help, even though we would freely give it. And that's all to do with, our, you guessed it, itty bitty shitty committee around um, our own perceptions about being weak and asking for help, which of course is silly because we would always give it to someone. So if you don't ask, you don't get. Uh, the other one is making less assumptions. So we need to start giving people a generous assumption or assuming that they're doing their very best effort. Asking better questions. So if you start asking better questions, you'll get better answers. And uh, this is certainly true when we're trying to figure out what's going on with someone's actions or behavior in the workplace or at home, depending on the conversations that you're having. But being able to ask better questions will give you better answers. So rather than why would you do that? We could ask perhaps, what is your thinking around that? Can you tell me what was going through your mind when you did it that way? And we could uncover a whole bunch of different things that we didn't know was gonna happen. Uh, modeling proven success formulas. So success leaves clues. If you have got someone that you admire or many people that you admire around how they are balancing work-life balance, you know, Emma Isaacs from Business Chicks is amazing. There's, a, you know, there's a plethora of resources around the world that you can draw from. Find people that resonate with you, start looking at what it is that they do and you'll quickly realize that success leaves clues and their success formula will start, you'll start seeing a pattern for what it is and then you can start applying that to your own life. And then our last one is taking 100% responsibility for ourselves and the situations that we're in. So I said earlier that uh, one of my friends calls me the CEO of my house and she thinks about it as like me running a business. And it wasn't until she said that, that I was like, you know what, I am the CEO of my house and I am the CEO um, of my business and you need to start acting accordingly. You know, you are the leader of your life. You're the only one that can actually steer it in the direction that you want it to go. So taking 100% responsibility of how you are going to show up and how it is that you're going to behave and who it is that you need to show up for is fundamental in, uh, in making your own success that way. All right, now we are on to the hacks. So this is my all time favorite hack. If you have got an iPhone, this is called Cozy and it is an absolute lifesaver for me and our family in our house. I've done a little screen dump on uh, of what we've got on next week, actually, I think next week. So Cozy is a organizer, but it works differently to Google calendars because rather than tasks being color coordinated, the people are color coordinated. So we've got uh, six people in our family. So six little dots there, plus grandma also has her own dot depending on uh, what she's up to and if she's got the kids and is helping out or, you know, grandma sleepover, which hasn't happened for quite a while. But uh, Cozzy is an absolute game changer. So a little while ago, Alex, my husband and I were talking about all the things that we have on um, for the week coming up. And I used to keep a paper diary. It worked for me. I always knew what was going on. Uh, but when you've got four kids, there's a lot of moving parts. And what Alex was saying is he was happy for you know me to be the keeper of all the knowledge. But then when he wanted to do anything or help me out when I was starting to feel overwhelmed and he could see that happening, is he actually didn't know where to find the information. So he had kind of no visual of what it was that was coming up and what would be a heavy week or what would be an easy week or what it was that needed to change. So um, this is one of the tools that we use. It's called Cozy. It's a family organizer. It's sensational. Uh, we can both add stuff in to it. We've got all of the uh, kids in there. They've all got their own color. 
we've got who's doing drop off, who's doing pick up, what sports there are. You can add in um, family plan, uh, not family planning, don't add in family planning. That would be weird. Uh, meal planning. So I meal prep every meal plan every Sunday, meal prep every Monday. Uh, you can put all that in there. So I can actually put in what we're having for dinner for the next you know, week, two weeks, and you can attach recipes in there and links to it. And if I'm running late or I'm completely wrecked or something that comes up, Alex can pick up where we left off and uh, and start going from there. One of the other awesome um, functions of COSI is that you can add in like shopping lists. So we just add to the shopping list as we go. And then if either of us go to the shops, we can see it on the apps or updates on both of our apps. Uh, and it's like a shared shopping list, which is super functional. So yes, I would highly recommend COSI for all things and um, start outsourcing, you know, whatever it is that you can. So one of the things that we said earlier early on is that you need to begin with the end in mind, which of course is so true. So if you don't know where you are shooting the arrow, uh, you don't know what it is that you actually need to do every day or what you want to do every day, it's going to be really tricky to do those things if you don't know or you're not clear on it or perhaps there's 800 things, but really there's only a few that are important. So I get asked all the time how it is that I do what I do and it's because I'm super laser focused with what, um, with what I'm doing every day. So I am a big planner. I'm a goal setter. This is part of the coaching that comes in. So I've got, you know, a five-year plan. I've got an annual plan. It's kind of gone out the out the door this year, but we'll, I'm redoing it this month. And from the annual, I do monthly planning. And then from the monthly, I plan our week. And from our week, I plan my day. So I developed over time. And this is something that I do every single day. And it is called the Crush It Daily Planner. So you might be looking at it thinking, that's great, but I don't really have time to do it. This takes me five minutes. I do it every morning. Um, I write it in a journal. Again, I do pen to paper because that's what works for me. But the way that it works is um, at the top on the right, it's got I'm grateful for. So I know from all the research that I have done um, over all the years that gratitude, success leaves clues, gratitude is so important for my own mindset, for my own well-being, for being able to recognize what it is that I'm grateful for, um, really gives me that boost of positivity. Um, and even when I'm having a rubbish day with the kids or a rubbish day with work, I know that gratitude is something that is like an anchor for me. So I write down five things that I'm grateful for, and it could be, you know, a weekend away. It could be, a, you know, yesterday's, uh, yesterday's thing I was grateful for is um, one of the kids made me breakfast, which is cold toast but you know someone someone somewhere made me breakfast and thought of me so that was something that I was was very grateful for underneath that we've got our top 10 so these are your hags or your big hairy audacious goals so I write these every um every day so this is my annual plan you know what is it that I want to get done or not even annually, this is like my big life uh, goals. What is it that I want to get done and how do I want to um, show up in the world? So one of my big hags is I am an exceptional, uh, loving, caring, loving and caring mother to my four boys. And, you know, we create family memory. So the, the key with a BHAG is that you need to write it as if it's already happened. Uh, one of my other ones is I am the fittest and healthiest I've ever been. At, 30, at not 35 kilos, at 65 kilos. So writing down your BHAG, your reticular activation kicks in, you start subconsciously making good choices towards the goals that you want to achieve. Over onto the left side, we've got uh, today I'm excited about. I write this every day. I need to find something that I am going to get pumped up for. Uh, today, it's the, the wing at webinar. Tomorrow, it'll be... I don't know, I'll look at it tomorrow. Um, but, you know, actually getting excited about something each and every day is so important um, to set our intention. Underneath that is who needs me on my A game. So this will be different depending on who you're thinking about and the setting that you're thinking about. But who is it that you need to actually show up for? You know, is it your kids? Is it your boss? Is it your team? Is it your partner? Is it family? Is it friends? Who needs you today to be on your A game? And if they need you on your A game, how do you show up for them? Underneath that, we've got our top priority. So there's only a spot for five top priorities. And if there's more than five, then they're probably not your priority. So work through the five. If you're going to do the Pomodoro, 
uh, method, that's a really great way to, uh, you know, really focus in on what your top priorities are, but limit it to five. You know, we get so caught up writing a to-do list that we spend longer writing the to-dos than we actually do doing the to-dos. And then on the flip side is uh, today's ta So for progress, we actually need to turn around and have a look at where we've come from and what we've done. And I used to I used to be in choice with such white slate clean. And in my mind, it would be like, oh, I've done nothing all week or I haven't done this. And whereas in actual fact, I've done quite a bit. It was just that I had uh, wiped the slate clean and wasn't acknowledging all of the great stuff that I have done. So if you wanted to come over onto the uh, Made For More Goal Getters um, Facebook page, every Friday we celebrate our tadas by writing them down and have a bit of a party about that. But it is so important to recognize the achievements that you have uh, made your way through and uh, just start acknowledging that. And it doesn't need to be huge, but we do need to recognize it and acknowledge that. And then underneath is the fill my cup, which of course we talked about early on. You know, I write down every single day what it is that I'm gonna do to fill my own cup. Um, whether it's a podcast that I've been looking for, whether it was some, something that I, that's just for me, that's for no one else. It's just for me. It doesn't need to go any direction. It doesn't need to have strategy. It doesn't need to be for the kids. It is just for me. So I do this every day. It takes me five minutes. It makes me crystal clear on what it is that I want to do. And I would love to uh, share this with you as well. Um, and of course, we are getting to the end. If you've got any questions, let me know. If you are thinking that you are feeling even more overwhelmed now than you were before, um, you can always book in and we can have a like a free session on, uh, you know, having a look at the label if you're inside the jar and see what is going on for you. But this is something uh, that I'm so passionate about. I know that it is hard juggling or uh, managing the blend and being able to get some hacks and tricks and tips and sorting our own stories out is super important to be able to um, have some progress. So begin with the end in mind. If you do want to um, have a chat about where you're at and where you're going, uh, please copy the link below and I will catch you soon. Thank you so much for your time. I uh, really appreciate it. And if you do have any questions, reach out.